Thank you all for coming. I want to thank Christine for helping set up the room tonight. Uh, we've been uh, really been receiving a lot of support from people on the university campus. I, I want to acknowledge the Aboriginal uh, Student Council as well. At the University of Manitoba, we've received a great deal of support from Native Studies. Uh, and uh, who am I forgetting? Um, I think I covered that. Um, my name is Ashlyn Hagland. I'm the Aboriginal. I'm the uh, advocacy coordinator for Pimichikamak. I could not pronounce Pimichikamak in June, uh, and I don't speak any Cree. So I'm going to let Jackson and Jason speak a lot of Cree at you. Um, please enjoy that. Uh, lean forward. Uh, pay attention. Um, it's a beautiful language, and as someone who gets to go north frequently, I get immersed in Cree. And, it uh, it's it's just um, it's it's music when you when you hear it, and uh, to be in a community that has been able to sustain its language is just a, a blessing. I'm mentioning this because we haven't had uh, a chance to offer tobacco to anyone, and I, I want to create a, a space for uh, appreciation and understanding. Uh, however, I'm not going to pray at you. <laughs> um, but I am really grateful that you're here. Uh, it takes a lot of courage to talk about hydro in this province, and uh, it's been a long uh, struggle for Pimichikamak and many, many other nations in the north and other peoples who live all along our great waterways in this province, uh, and of course across the country as well, on so many bodies of water that are affected by hydro development. Uh, we are on Treaty 1 territory, uh, so miigwech, thank you for coming. Ekosi, uh, thank you in Cree. Um, how many people here are used to hearing uh, Cree? <laughs> Jason's putting his hand up. There's <laughs> lots, they're just lots. not saying. They're, they're shy? That's crazy. Uh, so Eugenie and Ramona never hear Cree at all. You can tell them. <laughs> So ask questions uh, in Cree and or English. Uh, um, and again, uh, it's, it's uh, been a very difficult several weeks. Uh, I'll just give you a brief update. Uh, Pimit Chickamack uh, has been occupying their land for time memorial, correct? However, uh, Hydro has been occupying their land since the 60s. And that has not been a peaceful occupation. Genpeg, the place they have renamed Gideon McKay Memorial Ground, has been occupied by Pimichikamak in this last round since the uh, 27th of September uh, by very brave uh, women and men who have uh, held down uh, that space and worked with their community to build consensus about how they will move forward in a, in a brave and courageous way to again engage with the province and with Manitoba Hydro to try and address the concerns they've had since that relationship started in the 60s. Um, so I just wanna let the panel introduce themselves and uh, I'll start with Chris. Oh, sorry, Jason. <laughs> I keep calling him by his brother's name. <laughs> <clears throat> That's it. My name is uh, Jason Miller. I'm from uh, Cross Lake, Manitoba, which we know, which we better known as uh, Finichigamak. I was the former uh, youth chief at the time of the signing of the first written law, which is uh, part of uh, Finichigamak Okinawa. It's a part of the uh, four councils of power that, uh, that started back in uh, 95 when we took our sovereignty rights. We recognize that we are a nation. That we are a people, that we have a land base, and that we have a spiritual mandate to take care of the land. As the land does not belong to us, it belongs to the unborn, it belongs to the youth. Before I move on to, I would like to uh, acknowledge, uh, I feel that I have to acknowledge uh, a lot of our elders that have fallen, and a lot of our uh, warriors that have fallen before us, that are no longer with us here and joining us in our struggle, in our fight, to 
to maintain our land, our resources, our territory for the unborn. So I'd like to take um, the time maybe to have a moment of silence for um, a few others that I can name, but if I missed anybody, I, I did not uh, do this on purpose. But I'd like to mention uh, the late uh, Gideon McKay, late Sammy Beardy, Greta McKay, Stephen McKay, <coughs> Francis Ross, Jonah McKay, and uh, last but not least, uh, one of our fallen uh, warriors that I'd like to uh, uh, remember, uh, take this time to uh, remember my late father, who was, uh, uh, I spent uh, many mornings and uh, <coughs> evenings uh, talking with him about uh, the issues of the Northern Flood Agreement and our treaty rights. And he, he, was, uh, he was a great uh, uh, leader, he was a great teacher, and, uh, and uh, a lot of these people that, that have left before us, you know, they're, they're really instrumental in uh, you know, keeping Hydro to their promises, to what is written in the Northern Flood Agreement. With that, I'll uh, just like to take uh, just a moment, just to think. I was looking and ask him, but no, I thank you. And uh, later on in the discussions, if, uh, if you have any uh, questions or comments, uh, I can uh, chip in there when uh, Jackson does his uh, presentation. If there's any things that you'd like to know mm -hmm. as, as to what my purpose was as a youth chief with uh, Pimichigan Map Okinawa. And I thank you all and I greet you all on this beautiful evening. I hope you uh, enjoy this session. Thank you. Good evening, my, my brothers and sisters. My name is uh, Jackson Osborne. I'm from Cross Lake, the Michigamak. I'm a photographer since 1988 till now. I'm glad to be here again. I was here uh, 10 years ago, something like 10 years ago, with my late friend uh, Nelson Miller, counselor at that time, Jason's uh, father. So also, I acknowledge the elders too. My late dad, uh, Charlie Osborne, Albert North, George A. Ross, and a lot of lists of our elders that <coughs> that supported us and helped us, gave us the knowledge and uh, tradition knowledge and uh, the wisdom to pass on what we're doing today. My late dad told me to tell a story. This is what I'm doing today, since 1988 to now, telling a story. But before we start, I want to say opening prayer. We'll ask our Creator to bless this meeting so that we could communicate a good understanding, mutual understanding. So I'll do an opening prayer, I'll do an opening prayer. Everybody stand please. Thank you so much to you as from it now. I was at the biscuit. How about then, Mama? I bet that the Piatra must all eat it and do tell me now. I'm all she has scared you see time and two. I see that dog, Mother Earth. You're about to make it to my dad, Mr. Goose, in a new. The way you skin off, madman, to the way you skin off, miss. My name is Seven to a mean tie in a gay one. My way and what to my day, Chivia. Then I stood out to Illinois and what to my. And ask me in Seven to. And when I ask me dancing, it's Kate to my gay one. I wait on you. 
Ja se vei minä nyt tehdä ja kaikki no. Itä kaavus ja minä tuut tehdä minä kaavus ja minä se pani kutsi. Hän tavi etsi. Kiinä se on katsi, niin se mantuu. Ja se vei tämän pitkin vain, niin se vei minä se Es mua genuin. Amen. Okei. That's for now. I'll make my presentation later. I'm one of the Runty professors here. My name is Peter Kulczewski. I'm the acting head and a full professor in the Department of Native Studies at the University of Manitoba. I'm just going to say I did one time meet uh, Gideon McKay and um, I met Charlie Osborne actually at an occupation that Ovid Mercury had on a riverbed in, uh, in Grand Rapids. And uh, I knew about Sandy Beardy by reputation before that time. And I would say those were angry elderly men. Those were among the, they were the political dissenting class in the province of Manitoba, and it was an honor to be able to meet them and talk with them, uh, just as it is to work with Jackson and to work with Jason. And, uh, you know, the, the leadership of Pemachikamak, I, I think, are among the leaders of indigenous resistance in this country, and we should pay attention to them very carefully, I believe. But that's what I'll say for now. Steph? Okay. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Steph McLaughlin. I'm a prof. I don't really look like a prof, but I am a prof at the University of Manitoba as well. I'm in the Faculty of Environment. Um, I'm not quite sure why I'm here, because I know so little. Um, and uh, But I can talk about some of the insights I've developed over the last year. And certainly most of my insights reflect the deep and rich truths that have been spoken to me by the people who live in Pimachikamak and the other communities in northern Manitoba. And, uh, but, uh, So it's always good to begin in that good way, and I appreciate the fact that uh, we started over. Starting over uh, seems to be what needs to happen right now in this province in terms of reconciliation and this new relationship we keep talking about, but we don't see. So um, I really... Um, I think you pulled your mic out or something. Not bad. Oh, it's going in my... Okay, there, I'm louder, yay. Uh, so, um, starting over, good stuff. Um, it, is, it is something to, to behold to be part of this process and we're all part of that process, whether we're, we're engaged with it on a daily basis or if we're just thinking about it as we plug ourselves in and make sure we've got enough juice to get through the day to, to write all our papers and make sure our cell phones work. Um, so, uh, I should probably acknowledge that the Council of Canadians is here with us this evening as well. Uh, Ken, uh, thank you for helping us share this message beyond this room. And uh, Michael Welch is here, uh, also helping carry this message beyond this room. And uh, I, I trust that everyone here, oh, Jackie, <laughs> Jackie <laughs> also will be broadcasting. Uh, we are trying to manage our message the best way we can, but we're finding that sharing individually, talking, telling our stories, and, and having that go out, however we can do that, is, is the most effective because this is about relationship. So I appreciate anybody who's texted or tweeted or Facebooked or found us that way. Um, before we keep going, I should ask that maybe you consider what you're doing tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Uh, we will be gathering at the legislature starting at 3, and there will be a, a rally and a peace walk tomorrow at 4 uh, to the Hydro Building. Uh, this will be done in ceremony. This will be uh, a very peaceful uh, action. And we had an action last week as well, and you're probably wondering how many times do they march every month? Uh, the consistency seems to be uh, important right now, given the political pressure we're trying to create. So. Uh, if you can share this with your friends and family and, and join us tomorrow, um, we'll be gathering at the legislature at 4 o'clock and uh, having more learning and, and then carrying on uh, with, with a walk to the, to the Hydra building. Um, I'm noticing that most of the people in the room are fairly savvy about these things, but I do want to create a, a general understanding. So um, learning... Uh, in the big picture uh, about hydro is, is a daunting process. So 
Peter has promised to give us a sense of the overwhelming network of systems that Hydro has developed around the province and put GenPEG in context. Um, yeah, mostly what I want to try and do is give you a background so that when Jackson's showing you his pictures and talking about things, you'll have some sense of how it all fits together. And I'm going to try and do this as quickly as possible. I can talk really fast or listen really fast because this is going to happen fast. Um, so the Nelson River is called Kitchissippi. Um, basically, you know, Hydro had developments on the Winnipeg River that affected what was then called Fort Alexander then, and now called Saguin. Interestingly enough, they presented Saguin with a compensation agreement last summer for around $200 million, which the community rejected. But never taking no for an answer, no doesn't mean no to Hydro. They presented them with the same, virtually the same deal a few months later, and I found out it's not reported in the media at all, but just last week, Sagin voted no again to the same deal that Hydro is offering. So uh, kind of an interesting little development there. Uh, in the mid-60s, a dam was built on the Saskatchewan River at Grand Rapids, ending the grandness of the rapids, ending the existence of the rapids themselves. And at that time, the, the utility got more ambitious and basically started planning redesigning the hydrology of northern Manitoba. What that means is that they took uh, one set of uh, watershed that flows into the Hudson's Bay through the Churchill River. They built a dam at the north end of South Indian Lake on the Churchill River. They wanted originally to raise the water level there something like 10 meters, but were pressured enough not to be able to do that, so they raised it to something like 10 feet or 3 meters, uh, which flooded the community of South Indian Lake out of its location and forced a relocation of that community. They built a control structure called the Notigi con control structure and diverted the river, the, the water from the Churchill River, which is basically turned into a creek. They diverted that water into the, um, uh, the Burntwood River and all of that water flows into Kichisippi, the Nelson River, um, so that they have an increased flow in the Nelson River. They planned that in you know, the late 60s and implemented it pretty much in the 70s, in spite of the fact that uh, there were professors and engineers telling them you're, this is unnecessary. You won't need that flow for decades. But Hydro always has known what's best. And so they just went ahead, flooded South Indian Lake, forced the community relocation, and got the enhanced flow that they needed. Uh, they had one dam existed on uh, Kitchissippi, the Nelson River, uh, which was the Kelsey Dam. In those days, they, named, they wanted to name their dams after European explorers. That dam had been built uh, for the purpose of providing power to the, the, the mine in Thompson. The Churchill River diversion with the enhanced flow meant that basically they, were, they, they built several other dams along Kitchissippi. So they built the Genpeg Dam near the mouth where, the, where Lake Winnipeg flows uh, in, into Kitchissippi um, and, and eventually out to Hudson's Bay. Interestingly, the, um, uh, the technology for that dam was imported from Russia. It's all Russian technology. You can actually go right inside the turbines and the water's going all around you. Uh, and inside there you find Russian letter stamped, Russian, Russian language stuff stamped on all of these, uh, this equipment. So there was a, actually a crew of Russian technicians who joined them when they were building that dam. It's a little side bar to history. Um, and uh, uh, that dam, the engineers proudly tell you, um, controls the water levels on Lake Winnipeg. That, that basically effectively turns Lake Winnipeg into a reservoir. Uh, and then eventually, as part of the Churchill River Diversion, they built two larger dams, the Kettle Dam and the Limestone Dam, considerably downstream from uh, Pemichikamak and uh, Norway House near uh, present-day Gillum and the, the Fox Lake Cree Nation. All of those elements, so the flooding of South Indian Lake, the Notagy control structure, the Genpeg, uh, Kettle, and Limestone Dams were all a part of what's called the, the Churchill River Diversion Lake Winnipeg Regulation. When the communities heard this was happening, they didn't want it to happen. They, they joined together in a strong opposition movement to try and prevent the dams from being built. This was in the 1970s. So they formed a Northern Flood Committee to try and uh, fight the dams was the original intent. Effectively, the, the provincial government said, you've signed away your rights through Treaty 5, so you're not like the James Bay Cree, where you still have outstanding Aboriginal title, so you have no choice but to go ahead with the dam. So grudgingly, the community said, OK, well, we'll sign a deal and, and uh, see if we can get something out of this. The deal they signed was called the Northern Flood Agreement, or NFA. The Northern Flood Committee that had signed that deal consisted of five communities, Norway House, Nelson House, um, Cross Lake, um, uh, Split Lake, uh, and South Indian Lake. Oh, no, South Indian Lake wasn't a signatory. They were part of Nelson House. 
York. The Fox York. Lake didn't sign. York. York Landing, that's right. More people here. And we do have people, I'm pleased to say, from Tatasquick, Split Lake, and from the Situasic Nelson House. So we can also, you know, we have people who can tell us about what goes on in those communities. Um, the Northern Flood Committee, for various reasons, the government, you know, uh, attempted to, uh, once the deal was signed, kind of disrespect them and not see them as legitimate negotiators for the communities. So, that, so by the early 1980s, the Northern Flood Committee basically fell apart, uh, and the communities were left pushing for implementation of the Northern Flood Agreement. The promises they made in the Northern Flood Agreement were fairly strong. So in the whereas clauses, for example, it said that whereas people will be adversely affected, we are determined to try and find a way to make sure that they are treated uh, justly and equitably. And it said the federal government is committed to ensuring that Aboriginal and treaty rights are defended through this whole process. These are kind of ironic things to read right now. And there was a schedule attached to the Northern Flood Agreement, famously Schedule E, which said that they would work towards um, improving the well-being of the community, sponsoring studies that would work towards action plans for the eradication of mass poverty and unemployment. And so frequently you see that, you know, sort of uh, the notion of what, what's happened with your attempts to solve mass poverty and unemployment, particularly among people in Pemichicamek. The federal and provincial governments basically decided in the 1980s that they had promised too much through the Northern Flood Agreement, and they refused to hire an arbitrator to allow the communities to fight for their rights under the agreements. They were basically sort of trying to force the communities to go to court and giving them nothing. So, in fact, instead of improving the lives of people in the communities, first of all, the environmental impacts were far worse than anyone anticipated. Debris would come into the water. They reversed the natural flow of the rivers. They have the water levels high in the winter, because that's when power is needed, and uh, the water levels very low in the summer, you know, in the uh, uh, spring and early summer, rather than the opposite. Water levels are normally high when the snow melts, so in the spring and summer, and they get lower through the year, and then are at their lowest, sort of, in the late fall and midwinter. That's all entirely reversed. They also, you know, changed the water levels quite dramatically so that what had been safe crossings of these rivers for hunters who had hunted on them for a long time, suddenly, you know, they found people were dying by falling through holes in the ice and weak ice uh, that, you know, there was no way to tell that uh, the whole way the river behaved had changed dramatically. So you can talk to people at uh, Jackson's age. They grew up swimming in the Nelson River and drinking the water, and you could see the bottom of it clearly. They, they, uh, you know, people from Nisichwasik Nelson House remember going to s deeply sacred sites like the Footprints and Wasagi Jack's Chair and uh, being able to offer tobacco to those places. You know, freedom of religion, we, we all condemned the Taliban for destroying these Buddhist statues that was part of the sort of build up to our war effort. But actually, nobody in Manitoba knows about the Footprints or Wasagi Jack's Chair. We destroyed two of the most powerful sacred sites in all of Cree territories in the name of money and hydroelectric projects. Um, so uh, uh, by the time of the late 80s, early 90s, Manitoba Hydro realized it had made a mistake. You know, by, by fighting the community so much and refusing to implement the Northern Flood Agreement, it had generated what I've called a legacy of hatred. There are people who, whenever you say the words Manitoba Hydro, I spit whenever I say that. And in Northern Manitoba, everybody laughs because that's pretty much how people feel. Um, uh, uh, but Manitoba Hydro <laughs> decided it wanted uh, to build more dams and by the late 90s or by the early 90s it realized it needs cooperation of First Nations. Also in the intervening period the Constitution Act of 1982 was passed and that meant the Northern Flood Agreement uh, basically could start to be seen as a treaty and by the time of the CV decision in 1992 had to be seen as a treaty. So Hydro started offering communities one by one, not the Northern Flood Committee, but the communities implementation agreements, saying, here, we'll implement the Northern Flood Agreement. You, ref you take any of your court cases, don't go to court, uh, you know, for, for our bad behavior, and we'll give you so many millions of dollars. And for a small community that's pushing and trying to get anything happening and not having any success, those deals look fairly attractive. So four of the original five signatories of the Northern Flood uh, uh, of the Northern Flood Agreement signed implementation agreements over the course of the 1990s. The one community that refused to sign was Cross Lake Pemichicamac. And in fact, when everyone else zigged in a sense, Pemichicamac zagged. 
because instead of not only did they would they not negotiate a northern uh, uh, an implementation agreement and insist on holding Manitoba Hydro to the promises of the northern flood agreement, uh, they also decided to establish their own governance system. So they established a four council governance system: an elders council, women's council, elders council, and youth council, or an executive council. They embedded the existing Indian Act council system within that structure, so that. Um, uh, they could still deal with Indian affairs, they could still do all the statutory things that was expected of them, but they also had their own traditional model of governance. The former chief, John Miswagen, told me once that he would phone Ottawa and he'd be talking to Ottawa and he'd say, well, I have to get this cleared by the four councils. And the people on the phone from Ottawa would always say to him, well, you know, we don't recognize your governance structure. And John Miswagen would say back to them, well, that's fine because we don't recognize your governance structure either. So it all works out, doesn't it? Um, and, you know, that's, they, they still, no one's given them permission. They've asked for no permission. They don't need any permission. The only permission they need is from their own people. So they have their own governance system. They passed the first written law. They passed the hydro payments law. And as I said earlier, I think they have been one of the capitals of sort of indigenous resistance in this country for a long time. Now, what hydro, Manitoba Hydro has done is they've now started to go ahead with their next wave of developments. So they have approval to build the Kiosk Dam and to build Bipole 3, and they're working madly to try and get as much done already on the third, well, the next dam they want to build, the Karnawapa Dam. You might think that, well, they have to get permission. Actually, they're already building the camp, and they're trying to sink millions of dollars into it. The Public Utilities Board last spring said they, you know, the market an economic analysis seems to indicate that the Kiosk Dam isn't needed, and they probably wouldn't have supported the Kiosk Dam, but Hydro has sunk millions of dollars into it already. So it was more or less, well, you got to go ahead. They're trying the same approach with the next dam, the Konawapa Dam. And they're also saying Pemichikamek isn't going to be affected by these dams down because they're all downstream. But in fact, uh, during Clean Environment Commissions, there was expert testimony that said every new dam means they have to change the way they regulate the river. And that means they change the way the earlier dams behave. So the, the way the Genpeg Dam behaves will be changed as the Kiosk Dam comes on stream and if the Kanawapa Dam comes on stream. And I think basically, in a nutshell, the people at Pemichikamak, seeing all of this going ahead, said enough is enough. You know, they're, built, they're now going ahead with another dam. They don't feel any need to consult with Pemichik people. Uh, they don't see any need to provide any benefits. They still drag their feet when it comes to implementing the promises made in the Northern Flood Agreements. And you know, the, the communities that have signed partnership agreements with Manitoba Hydro, uh, all they've gotten so far from those agreements are massive debts. So the new model that Manitoba Hydro is offering, and you know, I have to clean out my mouth every time I say those words, the new model they're offering is in arguably worse than the old model. Now communities are going in debt as so-called co-owners of dams that may not be economically feasible. Um, so uh, I admire the stand that Pemichikamak has taken. Manitoba Hydro has been a bully in this province for a long time. It's driven people out of the province. It's, you know, I'm almost to a certain extent a bit of a pariah because everyone knows what my perspective is on Manitoba Hydro and people say I'm biased. And I have to tell them I'm not biased. I've been to the communities. You know, in Nisichwasik there's a place called the Bronx. You look at the houses Manitoba Hydro builds for its own employees, and you look at the trailers, and they have the, the affrontery to say during public clean environment commissions, oh, uh, modular mobile units are the most cost-effective way of providing housing for First Nations people in northern Manitoba. Modular mobile units. I love it. That means trailers, right? Whereas for their own employees, they build lovely suburban houses, brick-clad suburban houses, houses people in Winnipeg would be very glad to own. So you go into Grand Rapids or you go into Gillum, you'll see these lovely suburban hydro employee communities right next to trailers and trailers, poorly insulated, poorly supported, very little infrastructure, uh, all occupied by local indigenous people. Indigenous people are not gaining benefits from Manitoba Hydro. They're sinking deeper into a morass. Pemichikamek is taking a stand saying they've had enough. It's time to, to start changing this around. I'm glad you're out here, and I hope you'll all support them in their struggle. Thanks. Peter just covered a lot of ground for us, so I'm going to change uh, the schedule a little, because <laughs> awesome. Uh, what we really want to hear from uh, the, the people from the community themselves, I'm, I'm sure, uh, 
Jason, do you want to talk about what's been going on in GenPEG now, or would you like uh, Jackson to give the background on environmental stuff? Jackson, do the environmental stuff? We will defer to Elder Jackson. <laughs> I had breakfast with him this morning, so he's going to bring it. <clears throat> you want me to start now? Go for it. All right, you prepared to stay for 24 hours? <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. It'll be a long haul here. Where do you want me to start? You want me to start about this document, Northern Agreement? This is what they're talking about. This is called a Northern Agreement, signed by the three parties Canada, Province, and Hydro, and uh, NFA Committee. Oh, we're going to talk about interim license, 1970 issued to uh, Hydro, 1972 interim license. And I'll show you what interim license has done to our communities in uh, Treaty 5 territory. Now they're asking for a full, full, full license. We'll talk about the water levels, what they, what they mean by water levels, when they talk about water levels fluctuating up and down. I'm so glad to be here again, like I said before. My name is Jackson Osborne from the Michigamac. I never seen. I never gone to university. University like this. This university here. This is my second time coming here. I went to play Lovin High School, Forest of Prairie Residential School. I was there for four years. Residential school. I don't know what it's like to live in a residential school system. I went to a day school in Cross Lake from grade one to grade eight. You had to leave your community when you were in grade. To take your grade nine. You had to leave your community, your territory, your mom and dad, your family. It was a hard life. I'll talk about a little bit about where I come from. Like my dad was Charlie Osborne. He was a, a wise, intelligent man. He never went to school. My story here is about a hydro project. How it impacts tree pad territory. I'm going to tell the truth, and I'm not scared to talk about hydro. I'm not scared to talk about the government. I know what they do to our lands, our treaty rights, our kids, the unborn. I know what they do to our land, our burial sites, and I'm going to tell you what they do to us. That picture that you see at Polo Park, that big picture there, that's a false image. You wouldn't see a true image right there when I make my presentation. I've been a photographer since 88 till now. I've documented burial sites, our history, our ancestors, skeleton heads floating around in the shoreline. How would you guys feel that? Here in Winnipeg, happening right in Red River here. How would you feel it? There would be a public outcry, right? But in Northern Manitoba, it's quiet, silent, no media. We'll tell you about the debris. It will tell you about the erosion, the water, the dead beaver, the dead muskrat, the dead fish. It will tell you about Chenpe. It will tell you about the uh, God's creation, how, it's, how, it's, how, it's, how it's God's creation, the water flow has been destroyed, disrupted. It will tell you about that. I've got a lot to share, and I'm glad I'm here. My late dad told me one tell a story. Tell the whole world. And I'm here to tell a story about a hydro project that done to us as Manitobans in North Manitoba. I'm here to help you understand what it means about hydro. I'm here to tell you to help you out, Canadians and Aboriginal people. We have to work together, we have to understand each other, what's going on. This Mother Earth is Earth that you see. It's been destroyed by a lot of, a lot of environmental damages. Hydro, Tarzans, the mining, everything. Clear cutting. And we live here together. We live here together. There's nowhere, nowhere else to go. Look at the, look at the world, eh? It's round. Where are you going to go? We've been destroyed Earth. Where are we going to go? So we're going to help each other. We're going to understand each other what's going on here. I'm not here to hurt you people, but I'm here, I'm here to help you understand what we go through every day. It's going to have power, but every time you take a shower, make a toast, 
You're hurting us up north. You're hurting the four-legged animals. That's why I'm here to tell you. I'm glad to be here. And I'm not scared to talk because I have facts, evidence right there. I'm using it. I'm using the Canadian technology to use against, against the government. That's what they did to us when they signed Treaty 5. They were standing there with guns. Me, I'm using my camera today. It was backwards, eh? So my late dad told me, look, uh, my late dad worked, I will tell you about my late dad. He never went to school. He was a, a commercial fisherman, a trapper, a domestic fisherman, a hunter, a guide. And he, he was a, uh, he was a medicine man, and he worked for, uh, at that time, Water Resource, they were called Water Resource, became, they were the change name to Manando Hydro. They started from uh, Lake Winnipeg, right out to Killam Island. Killam Island is uh, near Churchill. Here's a man who never went to school, but my father lived off the land. He was born in a trap line, my dad. That's where he lived in a trap line. He didn't live in a settlement called a settlement called Crossley Reserve. But he lived off the land. That's where he was born. He never went to school. All he knew was about the water, the way of life, trapping. That's all he knew. But he worked for water resources from Lake Winnipeg to Killam Island as a guy. And there were lots of engineers from the University of Winnipeg and Manitoba by that time. And I don't know if they're still living. I'd like to know if they're still living. Because I'm really, really interested if they're still alive. Because my dad said there were young students from Winnipeg that were engineers. And I told him I was a guide. I know the land. I know the way of life of the land up north. Their school is the university, he says. My school is the land. This is my university, it's the land. Nature, fishing, hunting, this is my university. I'll teach you what I know. You teach you what you know where you come from the south. I told a young engineer at that time, he said, look, your mommy and daddy are waiting for you in Winnipeg. Your brothers and sisters are waiting for you. I'll look after you, I'll take care of you. So nothing happens with so just rabbits. And the portage is that you're gonna work here. I'll help you. And that's what he did. All these years he worked so hard by that. He worked in Chen Peck in around 70 or 71. That's where he got hurt and he stopped working. When he stopped working, he came back to our home and started getting pension money. And all these years he worked for Manitoba Hydro. His pension money went to the hydro utility bill, hydro bill. And he says, all this hard time I worked for this government, I do. Here I am suffering for using my, my pension money to pay my utility bill. And then they're living like kings here in Winnipeg. One minister came to my house, our house, my dad's house. And he said to him, if I get in the office, Charlie, I'll help you. That never happened. He lied to my dad and my dad was sick. So that's the story of my dad. And then one day in 1988, we went down a bank where I live. And the mighty Nelson River almost dried up, almost dried up. That's a narrow channel of mighty Nelson River floating. Why? They got Chen Bay case were closed in 1988. So I went down to the bank and with my late dad and I said, Dad, where's all the water going? See, I was grade 11, I dropped out and he never went to school. And he said, well, there's a dam called Chenpet. The gates are closed. When the gates are closed, all this river flows down to Churchill and Hudson Bay. That's why you see there's no river here. They're losing water in Cross Lake. It's drying up. And he said, all these times, I thought he had evaporated. That many years went down. Here I am in grade 11, here he was in a new education. 
And sometimes my dad will tell me, you know, it's good not to have a really good education. Sometimes right in the middle to have education, like grade 12 maybe. Because when you get your degrees and high education, then you get into trouble, your mind starts to say, you want to bypass God, God is the Almighty. You want to be like God, he says. So when that happens, he says, you want to fight God with your education and degrees, you get into trouble. You get into trouble with money, fraud, divorce, all this stuff, he says. It's good to have not, not, a, not a high education. So he said to me, um, get a camera. Get yourself a camera and start taking pictures. I want to start before, uh, before 1960. You want to show the video? Yeah. This is 88. This is 88. Huh? This is 1988. I'm looking for 1960. Oh, you want that one? Yeah. We'll talk about the uh, Pivot Chicago Project 1960. This is uh, the Michigan Cross Crossway 1960, the Florida Project. This area you see here, you can see clearly at the bottom of the lake, it was clear. At the bottom of the lake here. That's how beautiful Cross Lake was before the project. In our history, our elders talked about living in a trap line before the project, before Treaty 5. Our elders lived in the trap lines. The only time they came to a reserve and settlement Cross Lake was during the Treaty Days. Someone get your five dollars and ration and get some uh, tea, lard and sugar, something like stuff like that. But all these years they lived in a trap line. Hunting, fishing, trapping. And they lived in teepees. They lived in cabins. Some did not have houses. There were no doctors, there were no nurses. And they lived off the land, but they believed one thing. There was a creator, there was God. They always believed that there was somebody looking after them. Giving, giving them a, a spiritual help. Our elders were gifted. Our creator helped our elders. How did he give them help? They gave them a spiritual help. They gave them how to make a medicine. When a woman had labor, having a child, all they had was, there was no houses, all it was spruce trees where a woman, where a woman would lie down and have labor. The next day, they would walk again. Just one day. That's how strong they were because the water was beautiful and, and pretty clear. The roots, the plants, the medicine was good. The beaver, the wild meat, the food was good. There was, there was no interruptions, there was no, no projects yet. And that's how elders survived in a trap line. They were very strong people. They were always moving around, chopping wood, sawing wood, canoeing, battling, exercising, trapping. They were always on the move. There was no such thing as diabetes, no such thing as heart problems, high blood pressure, nothing like that. This is our history of Michigan, our, our elders. Our sisters here from Spitley can talk about that too. And my friend, I'd like to say hi to my friend Eugene. He's a strong woman, this lady. I thank you for coming, my friend. He's one of our supporters, peace and supporters, a strong woman. When I talk about that, so he believes too. Our elders are gifted. The gift came from God. They know how to heal people. When they had broken arms, when they had the uh, flu, whatever, tyria, they know how to cure these things. 
They were so powerful. They were gifted. And that's how they survived eating on wild food. Because the land was beautiful, the water was clear and blue, and they moved around every day. Imagine that life, just imagine. No doctors, no nurses. Imagine the life our, el our relatives went through. You know, when I look back on my research to our history, I'll check on the subject here for a while. I'm looking for a picture of Treaty 5 signing in Norway House. Treaty 5 signing in Norway House, a picture, I haven't found it yet. I'm looking for a, a picture of our first chief, the Bastion of 1875, where he was, he's buried. I'm looking for my aunties who went to residential school. I haven't found him yet. Two of them. I'm looking for my, my uncle who went to war, First World War. He never came back. They buried him somewhere there. See, these are the things that bothers me, my spirit. Now the hydro project. But many times my dad and my late mom, they were Christian believers, they were born again believers. And they teach us that things to love people and to forgive. So that's why I come here to tell you a story what happened, what's happening to us to us. It's a sad story that nobody ever told you. Like I said, I'm not scared. Our sisters from Spit Lake from the North can tell you what's happening. That's the thing you guys have never, never, never told, never, nobody told you. How many times have you seen environmental damages from the province doing pictures? How many times have you seen environmental damages from by the hydro people? How many times? I haven't seen none. All the buildings are good pictures of uh, North Manitoba. Three five is destroyed by hydro times, I'll tell you that. And there's more to come in talking about Kias and Konawapa. I mean, what do something? I'll tell you what my hydro bill right now is $400 a month in November. Now they're telling us every year this day, the hydro bill is going to go up 4%. 20 years from now, my hydro bill is going to be $1,000 a month because of the dams they're going to build. Me, I'm 62 years old. All my pension money is going to go there like my dad. And you guys are going to pay more too here in Winnipeg, Manitoba. You guys are going to pay more. So wake up. Help us out. You got to, we got to help each other. You got to pay more. And I hear the government in Manitoba is broke. <clears throat> Where does she get all this money for to pay dams in northern Manitoba? They borrow money from the states. If these dams are built, North Manitoba, Treaty 5 territory, people are going to pay more. Winnipeg, not that much, but less in the states. That's what's happening. And we have to do something about it. You have to find solutions, a way. What's the best solution? Maybe wind, wind power, maybe solar power, I don't know. Maybe firewood. <laughs> 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 so that's my story here. We have to do something together. There's no time to fight. Life is too short. My friends, life is too short. We want to do something now. For our children, our grandchildren, the unborn, we have to do something. If they don't do something, something's going to happen. What are you going to eat when everything is destroyed? You can't eat money. Money's going to disappear. The clan cars are going to disappear. Something else is coming. You've got to watch out for that. You sound like a preacher now, eh? <laughs> okay, before uh, Chempek, this is what a cross leg look like. This is uh, we call today the uh, Band Beach. 
This was the 1968. This was the most busiest airport in Cross Lake in the 60s. Transair, they call it. Anybody that came from Winnipeg, wherever, eh? That's where they landed. A doctor, a lawyer, a nurse, prisoners. That's where they landed. Today, this dock doesn't exist anymore. This is how they uh, used to uh, transport uh, when someone died in the community. They used barges to transfer it from the from one side of the community to the other side because they were separated by the lake. Okay. This is a treaty, treaty days. A treaty time is we have it every year. We get your five bucks to go to the treaty. And treaty five says we're subjects. We're not subjects. We are in Inyo. I'm a human being. I'm a person. I'm not a subject. That's why it says in the Indian Act. The Indian Act was not, was not made by us. It was made by the bureaucrats in Ottawa. We never wrote that Indian Act. So this is our treaty grounds in Cross Lake. The picture before that, go back to the picture there. Uh, here. The green scarf, that's my late granny. Sarah Jane Osborne, and that's her mom, her mom, Sarah, they used to call her Sarah Etawekapu from Nori House. So she married a man from Cross Lake, uh, her name was uh, Sarah Whiskey. So my granny Sarah Whiskey, his husband, well, it was a brother or uncle of uh, my, I was talking about the First World War that my uncle went, his name was James Whiskey. They went to war, First World War never came back. That's how it's connected. So this is Treaty, Treaty 5. See, when you look, when you look at Chenpeg, the dam, hydro dams in Chenpeg, we have God, God's creation. He created the earth. And he said it was good. The water flowed, the water, the Nelson River had his freedom. Lake Winnipeg had its freedom. They enjoyed life, this river. River is a secret. All of a sudden, man came and built a dam called Structure in Chenpeg. Once a structure was built in Chenpeg, God's creation was destroyed. The flow of the water is gone, disrupted by man. And what happens when man built a dam? Control structure in Chenpei plus the whole, the whole 35 territory. They destroyed the free flow of water. I will show you what I mean. I'll show you what I'm, I'm talking about. 35 territory on this side upstream of Lake Winnipeg. We're all affected either way. Either a dam is closed at Chenpei, we're affected. If it's open, we're affected. This is 35 again, the Wapak area. This is where you enjoy what we call, uh, we get together here every year, like three or four days. We get together here, tell stories, square dancing, baseball, soccer, lacrosse, you name it. That's the time the families got together once a year. Of course, I have five bucks. Okay, these are the people. Many of the people that you see here are all gone now. Eh? This lady here, an elder, that's uh, the late um, Lucy Amberful. I have a story. Like I said, story, telling a story about the history of Cross Lake, that woman. I have a cassette tape there. What I'm telling you here is just a small, small piece of information that I have at home. I have thousands and thousands of pictures videotapes, what I've done over the years, for the last over 20 years, documenting what's happening. I wanted to understand what they talk about at water levels or changing fluctuating. Michael? Mm, okay. So we see before Cross Lake, it was beautiful. And after that, like this is, it doesn't look like that today. Do you want to show the video now? Yeah. Where, where's the video taken on here? 
This is what I'll tell you, but it's 1988. Here. This is 1988 when the Tempe case were closed. This is what happened. All you see here used to be water. All water here. In 1988, they all cried up. And they tried to blame God, act of God, trying to blame this what's happening here. This is in our, right in our reserve. So what happens to the plants, the insects, the fish, where do they go? Where's our water, our clean water? This is across the reserve, what you see here. Today, it's all full of water now. This is 88. I talked about 10 big gates are closed. And kids want to swim. They have a long way to go look for water to swim on a sunny day in July. And when the announcements by the water is going to go down like this, say, eh, two feet, three feet, they don't tell you that what the impacts are going to be. They don't tell you. All they say is going to go down two feet, three feet. How does the, does the people listen to radio, radio announcements? I don't think so. The fish doesn't listen to radio announcements. The muskrat doesn't listen to radio announcements. <laughs> So how does he know? That's the government. And they're killing the muskrats and beavers. A muskrat is money, it's food and medicine. And the government of Manitoba is broke. They want money and they're destroying the same time money. The travelers are affected, the fishermen are affected. The fish are dying. Fish is money and uh, medicine. The plate of the traverse of this summer has been destroyed in Cross Lake. When I say the plate, the home plate, the food plate, I'm talking about the mighty Nelson River where there used to be, used to be lots of muskrats, lots of ducks, lots of fish. It's destroyed. You used to go fishing just down the bank, just down the bank. Today you can't do that. Serious and fish, but you gotta go and look where months far away. What you see here, nobody monitored this. And the agreement says they're gonna monitor it, monitor, monitor this, what's happening here. Nobody tests what's wrong with these plants. Nobody does any testing here. After the water came by, nobody tests the water. This is what they did in 88. I don't know what's going to happen to uh, if they build Kias and Kwanawapa. I think it's going to be worse. To me, I say it's going to be worse. But what you see here is evidence and truth. If they want to argue with me, they can argue with me. I'm here. They can talk to me in a good way. So, Jackson, I have a question. It looks like there's a lot of plants that have grown up there. How long was the water low for? I think this water was uh, the water almost much like this all summer. Okay. See, that's the thing, eh? Nobody has uh, done any uh, study or monitoring on this, what impact it has on a plant, on a plant eh? Some of the plants that you see is medicine. And it's food for the fish and the muskrats and the beavers and the seagulls. All these things, you know, we need to, I, need, I, I need to understand. Me plus other people, the children. What I'm doing here today to the university people here, I'm doing the same thing back home. I'm going to uh, 
grade one to grade eight and awareness of what's happening to the hydro projects and also from grade nine to grade 12. That's why I do in Cross Lake. I've been asked by the principal and teachers to come and make a pre presentation like I'm doing today here. And I'm so glad to do this to you people, I'm so glad. That's been my wish for all these years, for someone to help me and I'd like to thank the University of Manitoba for helping me. Without their help, I wouldn't be here. I met them this summer in Cross Lake and they asked me what I do. And I told them I'm a photographer since 88. So right away they were interested to find out what, how they can help me, I told them I need help. So this is part of the project we're doing. I'm trying to do, trying to organize and plan my pictures before they're destroyed in a fire. And we're going to make an agreement with the University of Manitoba so they can be used for reference, for study, anybody wants to study. And if you want to talk to me more, I'll be able to talk to you, help you understand, I want to understand you people. See, to me, I've been studying the new Canadian people. I'm impressed, and I'd like to find out, I got this question before. How do people survive here in Winnipeg? That's my first question. If you have a mortgage payment to pay, that's very expensive. If you have your phone bill, utility bill, university fees, taxes, car, vehicle, medical bills to pay. And you still, you still, some of people are still rich people. How do you do it? I'd like to know you guys, I'd like to study you guys. You've been studying us for a hundred years. And it's my turn to study you guys. Death. I'm really interested, how do you guys survive? You pay taxes and taxes. And here I am, uh, in a new, a treaty person. We agreed to share the land. Not to take all the land from us. That's not the agreement. The agreement is to share the land with you guys. As long as the sun shines, the river flows and the grass grows. That's the agreement of Treaty 5. When they, when they talk about water, they don't talk about the natural water, they talk about the women's water. The women that like, carry water when the, when the baby is born. That's what they're talking about. That's why our trees are on top, everything's at the bottom. The sun still shines. It's a powerful treaty. That's something you guys have to understand. We don't want you guys to ship you back to where you come from. We don't want to do that. We want to share the land with you guys. We want to love you guys, work together and meet your understanding. That's all we want as Aboriginal people. So work with us. Maybe what's happening to us will disappear. But I say that the seven generations here now, justice will be done. That's what we're told in prophecies. And that's what happened this, this seventh generation. So what you see here again is 1988. The place is a shoreline. That's where we used to go, uh, go swimming, go fishing, enjoy life, our interest. Now our interests have been destroyed. How would you feel if you feel your interest was destroyed? How would you feel? That interest has taken away from you. There's no money that can pay you back, no way. The land has been destroyed. They want to give us more money to fix the problem. How do you fix the problem? That's why they said we'll fix the problem. We'll replace it. Can't replace it any time. It's been done already. They're building more dams. What you just saw here is an interim license. In 1970, they were given by the government. Interim license, what you see, the impacts of it. Now imagine if we want, they want a full license. What does it mean, a full license? What does that mean to you people here in Winnipeg? 
What does it mean in Treaty 5 territory? They want full control. What does that mean, full control? Pull toast the Treaty 5 territory and wish us goodbye? What about our kids? Our grandkids? The unborn? The medicines? The fish? The muskrats? What about them? They want to be God. They want to copy God. You can't copy God. God is God. He's here with us. He's listening to us. He's a spirit. So the first part of 88. Just to show you what, what happens when the gates are closed in Genpeg. When the water comes, I the other problem when the water comes. See these announcements that they make, that they announce, I'll read, I'll read it to you. <coughs> these come from Winnipeg here, somewhere in Winnipeg. Here's an address here, I'll tell you the address. Box 85, Station, Maine, Winnipeg, Manitoba. September 26, 2014, Notice of Operation Plan, Forecast, Crossley. This is what they say. We get this from Winnipeg. They hit the ban office, they put them on the bulletin board, they sit on the radio station. And they read, they read, read, the, read the announcement, it says, On October 1st, 2014, the level of crosslet is forecasted to be 684.9 feet. Now what the hell is that? That's engineer term. What about a creek term? What about us Indians? Do we understand that? Does my granny understand that? No, they don't. I don't understand that. The level of the lake is expected to fall 2 feet 3 inches to elevation 682.6 feet by the end of October. <coughs> During the month of November, the level of the lake is expected to fall 1 foot to elevation 681.6 feet by the third week of the month and then raise 8 inches to elevation 682.3 feet by the end of the month. Uh, tell them, explain that to me. You guys are, you got degrees, you guys are professors. Tell me, you understand me? Okay. Imagine the people are going to go to school there. Imagine that this is what they sent to us. This is Cross Lake alone. Then they sent us to the simple West. Like I said before, what about the beaver? See? But they announced this. If you go trapping or fishing uh, 50 miles from Cross Lake Reserve, if this, if, if, this, if this was announced today, the announcement, when will it reach in your, your trap line 50 miles from, where, from your house? That water is going to go down two feet. 50 miles from the reserve, if you go trapping or fishing, when will it reach that? Nobody knows. I mean, the water goes down five feet, six feet. If you're a trapper at Walker Lake, 150 miles from Cross Lake, when will, she, when will that happen? Sometimes they say when they, they park their boat in a the shoreline, they go hunting in a bus. Mm -hmm. One guy told me, like, Chantec area, that when you came back, our boat was there, no water. Where did the water go? And they got stuck there. They had to walk to the, to the main road. Imagine a winter time. <laughs> My sister and I understand what I'm talking about. Imagine a winter time. When you release water inside here in the February. The fresh snow falls down, looks beautiful on top. You get walking, you skid riding, bang, you're stuck in a slush. And slush can kill you. Especially if you're a trapper and a fisherman. There's all kinds of stories about fishermen and trappers telling a story. And these guys know how to play their tricks. They can make a claim. And you know, they'll starve you. To, they'll starve you until you take that claim. And they know when to attack you when Christmas time comes along. 
If you make a claim, say twenty thousand dollars, then I wouldn't pay you right away. Tell where you go. They know when to attack you. And the agreement says the claims will be paid. But sometimes it takes them a long time to pay the claim. But they do pay. But there's no structure that we see that we agree to. People have lost their lives. This is what I'm talking about here. Slash. Some of the is about one feet. Two feet. If they get stuck in a trap on a mosquito, 150 miles from Cross Lake, and it's a cold January month, you fight your mosquito to get off the main track, and you're sweating, and it's cold. That ice is going to freeze up on your legs. Pretty soon you can't move. That's what happened to my late dad. He got stuck in a trap line coming back home. And I tried getting my skill out, I couldn't. By the time he said I was sweating and my my uh, my legs up to my knees were frozen already. And he went on another walk back to his trap line mm -hmm. by the distance and he made it. Yes, I was lucky, he says, my, the firewood was still hot in the cabin and he stayed. The fire didn't go out yet. So he made more fire. He couldn't, he couldn't take his shoes off but it was frozen. So I made a big fire in the firewood with a stove. Boil water, hot water. When the hot water was boiling up, that hot water poured right on his knees to melt that ice. And that's how he got free. There's lots of stories what's happening that you people don't hear. A lot of things. And that's why I'm here and say to tell you the truth here. The guy said, you'll be better to here 24 hours. We're going to talk all night. Right from the shoreline, right from the fish, right from the children's perspective that they can't swim. Go you part of this one. This announcement here. I was here the first week in October, the University of Manitoba. When I went back two weeks after that, October 10 or 11, I think, somewhere there, I got a call from a man who was so mad at, at me. He said, are you Jackson? He said, yeah. Are you the guy that's uh, fighting hydro? He said, yeah. He said, well, come on down here to my place. Bring your camera. So I took my camera, it's in here. And he said, come down to the shoreline, and the water went down. And my grandson broke his leg. So I went there right away, he said, come and pick me up then. And he did. So we went down a bank, the water went down. They were getting some water, I guess, and, and his grandson fell down on a rock, and he broke his leg. That grandson was born in Winnipeg. And I told him to make a claim. Make a claim right away, take pictures. And be honest, use this videotape, I'll, I'll use it as evidence. And I don't know if he did that, so I'm going to check up on him when I get back. And that's what happens when water goes down. Very dangerous. Either way, up or down is dangerous. And when that happens, up and down, water goes down, up and down, how much is hydro me? One rental salon and 10 big alone, according to the Hydro Report, they make $50 million water rentals to the province. And the province gives a license to Hydro. What does Cross Lake get? They bet you can get water rentals alone. $50 million a year, $45 million a year. Water rentals from Chenpec. The other issue, the water coming down from uh, Lake Winnipeg. How clean is it? Look at Red River here. You guys drink Red River? I don't think so. What about us in Northern Mountain and Nelson River? They talk, they talk about mercury in a fish. They talk about the, what you call it, E. coli, E. coli in the water. How many times has Nelson River and Lake Winnipeg been tested? 
All this water from Lake Winnipeg goes to northern Manitoba. When it hits Chenpeg, how clean is it? When it goes to Chenpeg, it goes to Cross Lake, to northern Manitoba. How clean is the water? How many fish are dying from that Chenpeg going to that dam? How many beavers are dying? How many, how many muskrats? How many dead plants are flowing that channel? All these things, you know, do we have no information? We just went to Norway House in September 8th. There's a professor here from the University of Manitoba helping Norway House in Cree Nation. We went to Chentuma Channel on Lake Winnipeg, me and Minerals. We used five boats, hydro boats. Chief Ron Evans was there too. And an elder, a fisherman from Norway House said, Play Green Lake, we can't fish anymore. The fish are all dead, they're all gone. That's what he told us. The beaches that used to be here are all gone, they said in Norway House. There's only one lake area left to fish, commercial fishing. And Norway House fishermen said, the last time we saw sturgeon was in 1983. Sturgeon. You know, Plague Green and Whiskey Chack, before Chen, but there used to be four rapids there. They're all gone and drowned by the project. A man died upper, upstream of Chenpeg because he, he hit a debris. Debris is the trees that are falling down to the river, to the lake. And some of the stumps that are left there for a long time are cut, submerged. The roads have been loosened, they start floating the water, and now it's a river channel. And this hunter was traveling by boat. When he hit that debris, and his, and his boat capsized, and he swam to an island, and somewhere that's where he died. So this kills. They kill a lot of people in Pemichigaman. And I'm sure other communities, our brothers, suffer the same. So what price for treaty rights? What price on wrongful agreement? This is about nature. You can't put a price on nature. Even from God. No amount of money is going to pay. Nothing has been destroyed already. Nothing. That's we have to find solutions. What can we do as Manitobans? As friendly Manitobans, as they say. We've got to understand each other. That's my message here today. I want to help you guys. You help me too. Help my children. Help my grandchildren. I want them to have a good future, hope. I want them to have clean water, <coughs> clean water to drink, a place to swim. But what's happening today, our utility bills are so high. See, even though we come to an agreement with hydro, if if the, the, the money comes and there's no free hydro power, forget it. You're not going to get nothing from them. Sure, there's going to be jobs, but when you work, you get your paycheck. Where's it going to go? Your hydro bill. So it goes in circles, eh? It goes in circles. It comes from the province hydro, they work, goes back to them. Utility bill. What's next? You build more houses on reserve, maybe 30, 50 houses per year. Out of the, out of the 50, 30 new houses that are built, more money for hydro, hydro bills. So you're getting nothing in return. They're going to give you $500 million, put it in a trust account, that money's going to be gone. 
Once it's gone, they, they sign an agreement, they tie us to agreement that people can get out. You're locked in there. So what do they do? The door's wide open, the province, the door's wide open. They give you a license here, have a gaming license. Have your bingos on gaming. You need a gaming license. And they say you're VLTs. Make money, revenue. So what happens if they make money on the share of PLTs? They get a budget from the federal government, $40 million a year for the federal government. And you start making money on PLTs for, for what, say, $8 million, $10 million a year. What's going to happen down the road? The government's going to cut that budget, $40 million, because you guys are making money anyway. That's, what will happen. That's what's going to happen. It's going to happen. That's what they want to do. And I, I got interested in politics in 1982, and I was just a young man. I was watching this TV, they were talking about the Constitution at that time. I didn't know what, what it was about treaty rights and uh, British rights, but I got to understand what it is. And that's where I started from, in 88, doing this year. I enjoyed it, Mr. Ojo. I'm still with you. <laughs> yes. I call my friend Michael here. I understand got uh, I call him uh, I call him uh, the Lone Ranger. <laughs> He's my friend, I call myself Tonto. Thank you, Mushapi. Okay, Sip West is part of our territory. It's uh, before he got to uh, Bowden, that's where ship was right in the middle. That's part of our history. Our ancestors have been living there for so many years. They trapped there. What you see here, this is ship west, our territory, traditional land, homelands. This is a burial site. Aboard our history, they said they used to bury people three feet underground. And then they, and after they did that, they put the rocks on top. This area is called Cross Bay in Sip West. This is a burial site. Sometimes you don't, you don't see this because it's flooded. Like it fluctuates, water fluctuates up and down. So they flood this thing. The guy with a hat. That's a federal government representative. Federal government representative. The guy in the middle is a lawyer from Manitoba Hydro, Bob Atkins. The other guy in the middle there, that used to be our lawyer, Colin Gillespie. That's my friend Tommy Monias. He's a fighter too. The lady there, I'm told he's a vice president for Manitoba Hydro, Rod Christensen. He's here in Winnipeg. They came to our homeland in our territory. They saw what they saw what's going on there. They saw the burial site. They saw the debris. They saw the trees falling down. We told them where, where the islands used to be. They're all gone. Eroded. All you see is just reefs, rocks. Sip West Lake is going to be like Winnipeg, but it's going to be like Winnipeg, it's going to be wide open. Because a lot of islands are destroyed, eroding away. And all our trees are falling in the river, causing navigation to be dangerous. And there's lots of fishermen out there, the trappers. Sure that the guys work out there collect, collecting debris. This is part of our territory too. This is locking I'm talking about. All these locks go to a uh, the fall, I'm told. Erosion of uh, Sip West Lake. And these are our friends, a hydro boat, a lawyer. That's uh, the guys that are uh, here for hydro, or a lawyer. So these guys came to our territory, they know what's going on. You have seen it. These are American friends. These two. 
Look at it, look at the place. Look at the tornado went through. And this is the impacts of the hydro project. These are American friends. They came to see them for themselves. They were in believe what we were telling them. And I said, come down across the lake. So I'm saying to you guys today, come to our territory. If you don't believe me, you're invited. Come down. When the water is low, when the water is high, in the winter time, come down. When I reach water in January, it looks cool when ice. He was asking to go for a right. See how far you go. <laughs> They're American friends. That's Kitian McKay. The, uh, the left, the late Kitian McKay. Powerful elder. In the middle, Kennedy Jr. Robert Kennedy Jr. is uh, grandson, I think. In the middle there. He came across the globe as well. You see in Cross Lake, you see in the Sip West, you see in environmental damages. That's my late dad on the right. And you see the background there is all that debris rose in the background there. These are the powerful elders that supported us, that helped us out. Without their knowledge, I wouldn't be here. They were so, they were so gifted. And here, that's a, that's a Federal representative there with a white shirt. And there we hit a reef. A boat, there's a behind here, that's a boat there. We hit a reef. And they were we were told these guys were experts of the, the Sidwest area. It doesn't matter if you're an expert, you still get into trouble, like right there. That guy worked there for so many years. And that day, you got blessed by your creator. What happened? With a reef. Again, these are our human remains, part of human remains, bones. There's an archaeologist from uh, Winnipeg here. He came to help us out. This is called burial site. These are the far below the effect there. I missed them very much. This videotape here shows you, it tells you a story about archaeologists from Winnipeg came to help us out to identify the skeletons that were found on the shoreline. How old they were, who were they? A woman, a man, and a child. It's all here, right in our homeland. And that's the end, we rebury the bodies on a heap, on a, on a hill, somewhere far from the shoreline. And it's all here. What CBC and CT have allowed us to so be sown, that's where they get their money from. If they get their money from the government, they're not going to show it. They're the contracts. All these things I talked to you about. In the 60s, they were planning here already in Winnipeg. Canada and the province, union people. They were studying already with the blood and Nelson River, what they were going to do. They were studying already without telling us, without consulting us, without our consent. Even Chenpei was killed without our consent. They built it. Now we're there today occupying that Chenpei. We're there today as we speak. We call the White House Stop House. Everybody's out. All the workers are out. They're not going to go in until what we want. They're not going to go in. We're in control right now. The main area in the dam where they control the flows, there's three. I, didn't, I don't have any people stop right there, but they'll be there for a while. We're occupying Champagne right now. We waited all these years for these guys to implement this Northern Agreement. This is the final agreement. This is the final agreement. 
We don't want any more agreements. This is final. This is our treaty. And they don't want to implement it. And the obligations here. There's all kinds of fancy words here. It talks about it talks about the lifetime of the project. That's a long time. They build a weir in Cross Lake. My late dad didn't agree with it. It was built. There were three channels like this, one, two, three, it was built in the middle. And my dad said, not gonna work. <coughs> When the elders heard about this, the dams were being built, what the engineers said. And the elders said they're dreaming. Only our creator knows what's going to happen. Henry Wright Schreier, Premier of Manitoba. Can remember Ed Schreier? He came to our territory in the 70s. We hold a pencil like this for our band members to be and citizens. The size of a pencil or a pen. And he told our members, the size of this pencil or a pen, that's how, how, how far the water is going to go down only, or up. Was he lying? Right? He was lying, eh? What do you say today to the challenger today, you guys? Our newspapers. Manitobans are saying to Silentry lied to you guys. That's the same government that lied to us. Now I heard they, they want to get rid of Silentry. So we're trying to help Cross Lake, Silentry, so trying to help Cross Lake. And that's what happens. One of your members tried to help Indian people. He get them out right away. I thought it was peace. That's what happened. One of our members, the hydro guy, he tried to help us. It didn't last long. It was gone. They changed him. All kinds of excuses. That's what happens. That's what you guys took to us. Not all of you guys, but some, some of them. And they were trying to work together. The Canadians want to help Indian people. And they start mumbling. Your friends start to mumble. Don't help them. So what do you do? Get rid of them. And that's a fact. That's what happens. Now we still with you. Guardian, any more? Got a little more time to have. I got 22 lots to say. hours. Huh? 22 hours. <laughs> I think we could sit here and listen to you all day. All night. Um, we're humbled by your words. Um, I have another break. <laughs> I, I think up. we should say thank you first. Can we, can we give you a round of applause? Thank our creators. Thank our creators. I brought some pictures I want to show it to you guys. We'll take a break here for a Jackson, I'll just give you a, a heads up. We only have 10 minutes yeah. before 9. Yeah. But you can talk as long as you like. I have a rule. I don't cut him off. going to talk to Give him talk. I'd uh, like to thank uh, Jackson there for his... Uh, expertise there for documenting uh, all the years and years of uh, environmental impacts that have been caused by uh, uh, Manitoba Hydro. At the time uh, of, the, of the agreement, the signing of the agreement, uh, that's uh, in 1977, I was, I was just being born at that time. And I looked at the pictures that Jackson just showed and how uh, beautiful our territory was how pristine our territory was, how green it was, and how our, our, our grandparents 
with just, you know, you'd be able to take your cup and go down to the to the river, dip your cup into the into the river and drink it. There was nothing wrong. There was there was no there was no hydro down. There was no. It was all natural, pristine. It was untouched. Same with the um, our medicines. They were pristine. They were untouched. The animals were healthy. The birds, the four the, the four legged animals, the beaver. The muskrat, the wild food that, we, that where, we, where we ate from, that was our refrigerator. That was our grocery store, our grandparents. Now, after the agreement was signed with, the, with all the adverse effects that, that came with, with the hydro dam, you begin, we start to begin to see where our people started getting sick. The animals started getting sick. Their trees are falling into the water. All these nutrients are falling into the, into the water, poisoning our river systems, poisoning our fish, our medicines, the animals. All the natural uh, things that we need, the nutrients that we need also to, to survive, to be healthy as people. I look also at the uh, our strong elderly people in the pictures and how old they got to be. They were healthy. Their life expectancy rate was much higher at that time because they were healthy. They ate the healthy food. They had clean water. I don't know if I can say that about myself. I don't know if I can, if I'm going to be able to survive as long as our elders did before the project because they were so healthy. With all the, you know, our refrigerator is gone. We can't go. The, 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 the food and the plants, the animals, they're all, they're all sick. We eat those things. Then we get sick too. So therefore, we go to the store, we buy these meats, there's a lot of preservatives, canned stuff. These are the things that also that get into our system and get us sick. We have problems with diabetes, kidney problems, heart failure. You know, the list goes on and on. And you look at uh, when uh, the human body of course, when you look at the river system, of course, you imagine you're diverting your veins, your blood, reversing the blood flow from your body. What do you think might happen? Do you think you'll get sick? It's the same thing with the river system. They diverted our Mother Earth's veins. And that's what was getting us sick. A lot of times, too, uh, at this time, it was it was kind of scary for me to, to go out hunting with my dad, seeing all this uh, the environmental destruction, and you'd see the debris, logs floating on the water. Sometimes, you know, it, it does make it very hard to navigate, especially if you, if you like Jackson said, it doesn't matter like, if you're an avid hunter, trapper, you know your territory, but you don't know what's going to happen because of the, the continuous fluctuation and all the environmental destruction, the fallen dead trees that fall into the drink. And these, are, and these, these are the things that our, our people, you know, eventually they, they hit. A lot of them, you know, pass away. It happened to uh, my mom's brother. <coughs> His name was uh, Matthew Whiskey. He was an avid hunter and uh, trapper. That is how he fed his family. That is how he... But when, when, uh, one day in the, uh, December, this was in 1988, I believe, 
as boys we were down the bank there playing, skating around, and we seen our uncle preparing, loading up his machine, getting, getting ready to go to the trap line, which he always did. That is how he raised his family, that's where he got his income from. But anyways, little did we know that day when he left to his trap line, that would be the last time <coughs> we we ever see him. Halfway to his trap line, I guess that is where he broke through the ice. And there was a fatality. His body wasn't found until the following summer. We couldn't search for him because it was winter time. We had to wait for the ice to melt so we could go out and look for our uncle, a brother, a father, a provider. When I look at also to the uh, there's a lot of hopelessness and helplessness that uh, the young people felt, you know, back home. There's a lot of anger, frustration, you know. All the, the, of all these broken promises, all these lies, of, for how many years, 38 years, they have not that the, the Manitoba government and the corporation, the, the Manitoba government, Hydro, and the federal government have not lived up to their obligations in that agreement for 38 years. They said that's the best modern day agreement in Canada. Now what happened to the, our, our, <coughs> our other brothers and sisters that fell on the wayside when the governments divided us and conquered us and took out the the smaller tribes with coming, coming in with the sellout agreements, taking away your Northern Flood Agreement rights, your treaty rights are tied in, in there. Why, would you, why <coughs> would you want to let that go? And taking our stand, we Pimichigamak people said, enough, we said enough is enough again. We will not be bullied by Hydra anymore. The young people have spoken. There's a lot of young ladies back home. They have spoken. We're not going to give in. We're not going to give up. There's hope for Pimichigamat. There's hope for a future. And there's also hope for our fallen brothers and sisters that were forced to sign off on other agreements other than the Northern Flood Agreement. There's hope for them also that they can, that we can reach down, grab them up from the river and say, hey, you still have your, you still have your treaty rights. You still have hope. They're not gone. <clears throat> this is a very, um, a very, very broad issue. Like as uh, Jackson said, he can talk to you for 24 hours. With the, the little time span that we have right now, it's, uh, there's so many issues that need to be touched on and a lot of information that needs to be passed on to the general public, to Manitobans, to Canadians, to the world. So they can understand, fully understand where, who we are and where we come from and what we want to do. So with that, uh, I don't want to take up too much time, but if if you have any questions, or I'll be able to try and answer the best I can.